1989, residents of a close-knit apartment community in Virginia gathered for a holiday celebration. For Tammy Brannan and five-year-old daughter Melissa, Christmas was always a special time. Then, without warning, the little girl was gone. Her disappearance ignited an impassioned search. Law enforcement and the local community spared no effort. But would they piece together the evidence and find her before it was too late? In 1989, in front of close to 200 witnesses, a child disappeared. Five-year-old Melissa Brannan vanished from a Christmas party at her mother's apartment complex in Virginia. Children have a way of wandering off, but it soon became clear this was more than a case of a lost child. Someone had taken Melissa. What sorrow compares to a mother's grief? What kind of monster preys on children? I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The hunt for Melissa galvanized the community as a nation held its breath and waited for word. All victims deserve justice. All criminals must be punished. But when a crime involves a child, the stakes become so much greater. On December 3, 1989, the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton, Virginia, held its Yuletide Christmas party. The Woodside was a large but friendly complex, a community that revolved around family life and children's activities. The kids were always excited about the party, which meant special treats and presents. A single mom, Tammy Brannan, had found in the Woodside Complex a safe community in which to raise her only child, Melissa. As the evening wound down, Tammy stopped to visit with a friend before going home. Can I go get some potato chips? Okay, we'll come right back. Okay. She lost sight of her daughter for only a few seconds. But that was long enough for our mother's worst nightmare to begin. disappeared. The Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department was called immediately. I'm going to do everything I can to find your little girl, but you have to tell me everything you can possibly Detective Bill Wilden assured Tammy they would do all they could to find her little girl. The detectives began questioning the people at the party. No one could recall seeing Melissa leave the party or anywhere near the front door. I'm Detective Wilden. This is Rappaport with the Richard Rappaport, the Fairfax Department search commander, joined Detective Wilden to organize the search party. If you come across anything suspicious, an article. He would head up the investigation. Does everyone understand? One of the possibilities, of course, there. was that she had just uh, hidden somewhere in the building, was playing with some friends, or had wandered off. So immediately the patrol officers on the scene did a very good job of searching the building and they began a search of the immediate area surrounding the building. The night of December 3rd was a bitterly cold night in the Washington area. Uh, someone outside that was five years old without a lot of protection probably would not have survived uh, through the night. It was that cold. 
outside with flashlights. Rappaport coordinated a more specific grid search of the area with patrol officers and dozens of volunteers from the complex. The search effort began. Nearly a hundred neighbors, police, and army personnel from nearby Fort Belvoir combed the woods around the complex. Most were parents themselves, united by a single concern, to find Melissa. Like the detectives, they expected to find a shivering and frightened little girl lost in the dark woods and crying for her mother. Officers began to question the 200 people who had attended the park and interview over 400 other Woodside residents. Though the complex was large, many residents knew Melissa and knew her to be very shy. Shocked to hear that she had disappeared, almost all expressed doubt that she would ever have gone off without her mother and certainly not with a stranger. Detective Wilden went with Tammy to her apartment to interview her. He questioned her extensively about her past and possible troubles with her neighbors or employer. An accountant, she had never had any problems with anyone. Tammy had lived at Woodside for over three years since her divorce from her husband in Texas. She had experienced the normal readjustments of a newly single mom but she and her ex-husband were on good terms. When detectives discovered an open window in the furnace room, Jim Gobin, the crime scene investigator for the Fairfax County Police Department, was asked to examine it. The way the door was set up, everybody had to either go through the crowd to get out the front of the building. Uh, that was only the main door and the only door available to get out, uh, with the exception of the, the hallway down to the bathrooms and the furnace room, they had large, uh, large windows. And then in, in the furnace room itself had a, a, a window, what was discovered open. And from there, the assumption was made that possibly that's how she uh, was taken from the building. Melissa's disappearance was suddenly far more complicated. The search for a missing child had become a possible abduction case. Did you see her leave the party at any time? The police continued their questioning with even greater urgency and began to hear repeated mention of the strange, even bizarre behavior of the maintenance man for the complex. Several of the women reported how offended they were by extremely vulgar sexual propositions made to them by Caleb Hughes. There was a possibility that if she had been abducted for sexual purposes that she might be molested, but we were very, very um, hopeful that we could at least find her alive uh, before her life was in jeopardy. Now that they were dealing with a possible abduction case, detectives returned to Tammy's apartment and collected nightgowns, hairbrushes, and bedclothes, any items bearing traces of Melissa. Can you describe As detectives continued questioning the people at the party, they learned more disturbing details about Hugh's behavior that night. He had spent what seemed to many to be an unusual amount of time playing games with the children. He made the parents uneasy by touching the kids. There was something unsettling, something indecent about him. At the party, he was not dressed. Uh, uh, as well as the rest of the people he were his work clothes. Um, he mingled with some of the people he knew at the party and he spent some time talking with Melissa's mother, uh, making comments about Melissa and offered to take Melissa and a couple of the other children to the restroom if they needed to go. He just had some very suspicious behavior from a man of his age around the children. With growing suspicion, the detectives tried repeatedly to reach Hughes by phone and then went to his house, but were told by his wife that she had no idea where he might be. Were you playing with her tonight? He had left the party sometime before our arrival there. He lived only four miles away, but it took us several hours for us to contact him because he had not yet returned home. Finally, two and a half hours after Melissa's disappearance, 
Caleb Hughes called the police, who then returned to his house. Upon questioning, he claimed he had simply taken the long way home. The officers immediately noticed he was wearing different clothing from that reported by witnesses at the party. I washed clothes tonight when I got home. Can you see them? They're in the washing machine over there. In the washing machine, they found the clothes Hughes had been wearing, as well as his sneakers and a leather belt with a knife sheath. The knife was missing. You washed your shoes at 2 a.m. in the morning? Here. He'd been gone for several hours, and to come home in the middle of the night when your family was asleep, and to feel the immediate need to wash everything you had been wearing, including your shoes, we found that rather suspicious behavior, and that just further added to our our interest in, in his whereabouts. As Hughes appeared reluctant to speak in front of his wife, the officers decided to take him to headquarters for further questioning. Suspecting that Hughes might be covering for time spent with a girlfriend, the officers wanted to allow him the opportunity to tell the real story. Do you know Melissa Brannon? No, I do not. To the detective's surprise, there was no real story. Hughes had no alibi. He claimed he had no idea who Jones. Melissa was, that he had driven the yeah. long way home Why alone were you washing your after shoes? picking up a six-pack, and then had simply washed his clothes. You normally wash your shoes with your clothes? Sometimes, yeah. What were they dirty with? He said as an excuse that, that were, they were his only work clothes and he had to be to work the next day and they were dirty, so he needed to clean them for work. Look, am I being charged with anything? Despite hours of intense questioning, Hughes remained no, no, smug and evasive. I'm free to go. Finally, yeah, Detective to go. Wilden told him he was free to go, but I know you're he was almost certain Hughes was lying. Well, you're going to have to prove it then, aren't you? As far as the Fairfax County Police Department was concerned, Caleb Hughes was the prime suspect. Believing Caleb Hughes was involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Wilden contacted Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan. It was a suspected homicide, certainly by then. He made some statements that, that were out of character for somebody who really you know, is Brandon? a suspect in a uh, crime yeah. of this nature. You would Please normally think the, the minute somebody would suggest you or I oh, have a, abducted a five-year-old child, Look, I mean, you would think we, it would be the most vigorous, vehement outburst. Of course I didn't. Well, they got nothing like that. Matter of fact, at one point he said to, uh, he said to Wilden, prove it, which is, uh, again, a, an unusual reaction for somebody who had nothing to do with it. Gogan had photocopied Melissa's picture and printed hundreds of flyers to help in the search. And as the sun came up, the, the search expanded um, into you know, further down south on the highway. Um, they sent soldiers out to do uh, uh, massive searches through the woods, along the railroad tracks, and, and as possible ideas of, of locations where she might have been were developed. Again, um, hundreds of people were, were uh, gathered to search and walk those areas. The car Hughes had been driving that night belonged to his wife. She gave investigators permission to impound and search it. Detectives examined it for fingerprints, blood, fibers, hair, any evidence that would document Melissa's presence there. Fingerprint tests revealed that only the Hughes family had left prints on the car. Next, all the hairs and fibers needed to be collected from the interior. This type of trace evidence was usually retrieved with a vacuum cleaner, but there was simply too much debris inside. When I first approached the car and looked inside, I, I just kind of went, whoa. Uh, they had two large dogs, the Hughes. Um, they carried them a lot in that car. They were, it was just cluttered with dirt and debris and, and just, just a mess inside that car. And, and I just kind of shook my head like this was going to be a, a real challenge. So I decided to, uh, to, to use the masking tape 
as an alternative to the vacuum cleaner, just hoping to uh, just get what was on the surface. That was an unusual technique, certainly. Um, in, in my years, that was the first time I ever had run into it uh, in the Fairfax uh, Police Department. And uh, it's, it's a very common technique now. Gogan then placed the tape between layers of clear plastic so that it could be examined intact under a microscope. As the car processing continued, Melissa's disappearance quickly became the lead news story in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Melissa Brannon is three feet tall, 48 pounds with blue eyes and dark blonde, shoulder-length hair. She was last seen wearing a pink ski jacket, red plaid skirt, and black shoes with gold buckles. The night of the party, Melissa had been wearing a navy blue acrylic sweater with a Sesame Street Big Bird picture, red tights, a red cotton plaid skirt, and a pink parka. Uh, when I found the red and blue fibers that were visible on the tape, I, I did kind of get uh, excited about that. But at the time, I was excited but worried because we needed to find her to, to identify uh, the clothes, the possible clothes. Without Melissa, that was going to be real tough. When Gogan conducted luminol testing on the interior of Hughes' car, he found traces of blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and floor mat. When a light is shined on the luminol-treated area, blood stains will appear fluorescent. While the luminol process is quite accurate as a blood locator, it can also destroy the genetic characteristics of the sample. When I sprayed the steering wheel, I got the reaction on the steering wheel, and as well as on the, the pedals of the vehicle, that's where the, it, it fell to. Um, these items were swabbed and, and collected. Hughes's shoes had been washed but the lab was able to identify possible blood stains on their soles where fresh cuts had been made. It became very suspicious when I received the clothes from the, the officers who searched the house and noticed that he had uh, cut his tennis shoes. Um, kind, of, kind of putting two and two together that why was he cutting his tennis shoes and why did I get a reaction to blood on the gas bottles? Surely Caleb Hughes had tried to cover his tracks to avoid a link to an unimaginable crime. What is your name? Cato Hughes. How old are you? With the luminol findings showing blood in his car, the detectives were increasingly confident they could get a confession from Hughes. He was brought in for a polygraph test. He had no explanations for the fresh cuts on his shoes. No. Once again, he gave no explanation for the two hour, 30 minute delay in getting home. But as it turned out, there never was an explanation. He said, I just took the long way home. It was the best they got. Did you harm Melissa Brandon? No. Did you kill Melissa Brandon? No. He's a proven to be deceptive. When Hughes denied outright that he had killed Melissa, Polygraph examiner Rick Danielle was sure he was lying. He really denied ever having seen this child, denied knowing who the child was. He was shown pictures of her, never seen that child before. And of course, the police knew that was not true because he had been at the same table with the child, had talked to the child. You got the wrong guy. I'm asking about what you did. You got the wrong guy. Danielle was absolutely satisfied he was hiding something, that uh, he was lying about something. I'm out of here. He was attempting to deceive him. But of course, none of that under Virginia law, uh, as you may know, none of that's evidence. Uh, you're not allowed to use it at trial. Investigators were convinced Hughes had abducted and harmed the beautiful little girl. But Tammy Brennan tried to keep her hope alive, fighting her worst fears. Melissa's Christmas presents waited under the tree. News 7 has confirmed tonight that the investigation into the disappearance of five-year-old Melissa Brennan appears to be focusing on one primary suspect. Police will continue their search efforts and to pursue leads. There is now a $10,000 reward for any information concerning Melissa's whereabouts. For Tammy Brennan and her parents, the hours passed in an agonizing wait for more information.
Melissa's disappearance electrified the tiny rural community of Lorton, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Only five months earlier, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been bike riding in her neighborhood when she was abducted, raped, and murdered. Her killer had never been found. Rosie's mother quickly came to Tammy Brennan's support. The yellow ribbons that punctuate trees and balconies at the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton have weathered Once Melissa's disappearance was reported on the news, the community rushed to her support. To yellow ribbons began appearing on Christmas trees throughout the area. Uh, by all indications, Tammy was a wonderful mother, a very loving mother, very, very protective of her child. Melissa was her only child, and I, I just think all those facts together struck a chord that virtually anyone could identify with those circumstances, and, and people's hearts went out to the, to the Brannon family. Hundreds of people volunteered to post flyers throughout the region and assist the local authorities in their search. A new expert was also brought into the search effort. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent John Goad, one of their search and rescue consultants. And we are uh, legislated into being as the state clearinghouse for all the information regarding missing persons. And we also assist families and law enforcement, kind of as a liaison between the two, uh, working as many cases as we can. After debriefing, Goad and his partner went directly to the apartment complex clubhouse. Check a stride out here. Outside, they found adult male footprints leading from the furnace room window to a split rail fence whose top rail had recently been broken. We began to find transferences on the other side of the fence into a small parking lot there beside the clubhouse uh, in the parking lot, I think, with an abandoned restaurant or some type of building there. And that's where the track stopped. Straight through here, over this fence. Right from the beginning, we found the adult footprints, but we never found a child's footprints. So we felt comfortable that if that was the abductor we were looking for, and we felt pretty comfortable that it was, that Melissa was probably being carried even from out, outside the window, was being carried by the abductor to the point where she, she and the abductor got in the vehicle. But yeah, where would Hughes have taken her? I don't know. Detectives received a lucky break when they interviewed Hughes' wife. To come in. She had been somewhat suspicious that he might go somewhere else after work. She didn't want him to go anywhere except to work and directly back home. And so unbeknownst to him, she had made a note of what the mileage was. And the following day told us that she had checked the mileage again and that 12 miles had been put on the car. We now had a p another piece of possible information about the extent to which okay, he could have gone that night. We first marked the location of the crime. This was the apartment complex in southern Fairfax County. We next located Caleb Hughes's residence, which was in northern Prince William County, roughly in this area. We then took a string that was the equivalent of 12 linear miles and tied the two ends of the string together and placed them over the pins. So we simply took a pencil and defined that area so that any point at the end of that string represented the outer limits of the search that was conducted on December the 8th. Within three days of Melissa Brannon's disappearance, investigators had organized a 25 square mile joint search with the Army, Police Department, Civil Air Patrol and Coast Guard. Over 500 volunteers turned out for the effort. We have a 12 mile radius that we need to cover. We had dozens of search teams that were comprised of trained law enforcement people, civilian volunteers, and military personnel. They were doing step-by-step -step searches of defined areas. Each area had been broken down and was assigned to a team. We're going to be looking for the clothing a lot. That's going to be one of the main things. They had specific instructions on how to search. If they found anything which they thought might be evidence, they were to mark it, uh, not to disturb it. And we had teams of crime scene people who would then respond to that particular location and process the evidence. At this point, we've not found anything today that puts us any closer than we were this morning. 
the volunteers were frustrated and extremely disappointed. I know there were nights when I would go home and my family would have seen a newscast about another day of searching and my own children would say, Daddy, are you, are you going to find that little girl? When are you going to find that little girl? And, and I think that was a conversation that was occurring in the homes of dozens of investigators and police officers involved in this case. While the search continued, Gogan approached the nearby FBI lab with the evidence he had processed from the car. Because Melissa was still missing, the FBI's state-of-the-art technology would be critical in establishing the connection between the hair, fibers, and blood stains collected and Hello, Melissa Brannan. Agent Doug Diedrich of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit would examine the evidence. Perhaps he could find a link to Melissa Brannan. There, you have to go to extraordinary measures to try to recreate, if at all possible, the environment of the victim, the most recent environment, and also the types of hairs that the victim may have, the type of clothing that the victim may have, uh, may have been wearing the night of the disappearance. And that's, that's the difficult part. As long as Melissa was still missing, filing charges against Caleb Hughes was all but impossible unless compelling evidence could be found. Diedrich and the lab examiners were impressed by the large number of fibers that had transferred onto the passenger seat of Hughes's car. Fairfax County investigators had identified nearly 70 different fibers. That included the, the blue acrylic fibers, the red cotton fibers, the black rabbit hairs, and, and there were, uh, I believe, uh, one or two head hairs in the case. But that's monumental. Sounds like a small number. That's huge. Once the FBI entered the case, its agents conducted their own investigation of Hughes's house. When Caleb Hughes's name was released as the primary and only suspect in the case, a media frenzy followed. Hughes has not been charged in the case, but he is the target of round-the-clock surveillance by the FBI. Federal investigators working with police from Fairfax County last night executed a search warrant on the groundskeeper's rented townhouse. They recovered several items which have been taken to the FBI laboratory to be tested to see if there is any evidence linking this man to Melissa. In the meantime, the FBI's official comment is no comment. The FBI brought the power of a federal grand jury to the investigation. The grand jury ordered Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests, something the local authorities had not been able to order. Hughes complained bitterly in interviews that his life had been ruined by the invasion. Details of a troubled past emerged. Hughes grew up in an abusive, dysfunctional home. He had a record as a juvenile delinquent, a long history of drug and alcohol abuse, and a disturbing attraction toward children. As an adult, he had been convicted of larceny. He had been convicted of car theft. Um, he had been convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The evidence indicated that he did spend a, uh, a lot of time with young children, nobody the age of, of Melissa Brannan, but certainly a, a, a lot of children in their early teens. In the lab, FBI examiners had begun analyzing the stains on the soles of Hughes's shoes. Though luminol testing had damaged the samples taken from Hughes's car, they became increasingly convinced that these minute traces contained blood serum proteins that could determine the crucial connection to Melissa. This blood's been this the samples were submitted for DNA and serology tests. Fifteen days after Melissa's abduction, a candlelight vigil for Melissa was held at the apartment complex. The little girl's disappearance had united the Fairfax community in compassion and outrage. And 
during that whole Christmas season of 1989, that every night on the six o'clock news, she saw uh, the video shot that her grandfather had taken of, of Melissa Brannon. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I was like many, many people in the metropolitan area of Washington who felt that they knew her from, from seeing this lovely child every night on television. But shortly after New Year's, a judge in the next county received a letter from Hughes's probation officer informing him that Hughes had violated probation for an auto theft conviction two years earlier. On January 24th, the judge revoked Hughes's probation and he was finally put behind bars. The earliest he could be released was November, giving the Fairfax County prosecutor ample time to build his case. Without sufficient evidence to file charges, Hughes had remained free. But now, with Hughes safely put away, the FBI had the time needed for the extensive testing required by the trace evidence. There was still a chance Melissa's body might be found, but without it, the case against Hughes would have to be made in the FBI lab. Already, FBI examiner Doug Diedrich had found his first big break in the case. I remembered some black animal hairs in the debris from the front seats of the car. And in looking through the little girl's nightshirt, I noticed these similar black hairs sticking out of, out of the nightshirt. So it just rang a bell. I went back, mounted those up on slides and compared them, and sure enough, dyed rabbit hair and they matched each other. The rabbit hairs from Hughes's car and those found on Melissa's nightgown both revealed a distinctive corn cob texturing, an exact microscopic match. Agent Diedrich immediately called the prosecutor to determine whether Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat. Not only was it confirmed that Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat, she had worn it to the Christmas party. Her mother had bought it in Germany, and it was dyed an extremely rare bluish-black color almost unknown in the United States. Melissa had handled the coat at the party and at home. Diedrich had made the crucial connection between Melissa and the car of Caleb Hughes. So you not only you tied those rabbit hairs, you tied that match not only to the fur coat of her mother, you tied it to the front seat of the car, but you also tied it to the child's environment itself, uh, the rabbit hairs on the, on the shirt of the child. To me, I, that was a significant point in the case, because then it starts pushing me in the direction of, we might have something. And, and from there, it was a matter of digging some more, see if I couldn't find some additional fibers that may be of value. So I started digging a little bit more, started looking a little closer, asking questions of myself, asking questions of the evidence, because it's speaking. Strange, but it's speaking to me. As week after week passed, Melissa's name eventually disappeared from the news. Life in Fairfax County had returned to normal, but Tammy Brannon was still no closer to finding her child. All right, all right. It's tremendously difficult for the family to come to terms with everything that that has gone on to come to terms with, with still trying to hold on to that glimmer of hope that their child's alive, and then the realization that in all likelihood, you know, they may never find their child alive or may never find the body of their child, even after they've been murdered. Tammy was forced to face the reality that by now, there was almost no chance Melissa could still be alive. How did you do it? We wanted to close this case, and, and not just close the case in the sense of identifying and prosecuting a suspect, but we wanted to bring real closure to the case in answering the question, what happened to Melissa Brandon that night? Why did it happen? Such questions plagued Tammy Brandon. Depressed and unable to work, she remained secluded in her apartment, waiting. Agent Diedrich had examined the blue acrylic and red cotton fibers in the passenger seat evidence collected by Jim Gogan. At first glance, they appeared to match descriptions he had been given of the red tights and Big Bird sweater Melissa wore that night. 
But without a duplicate outfit to make an exact fiber comparison, he was at a dead end. And so I went home, spoke to my wife. Of course, she straightened me out right away that if it had a big bird on it, it wasn't Winnie the Pooh, and it had to be sold to J.C. Penney's, having young kids of my own about the same age. Diedrich asked his wife if she kept any old J.C. Penney catalogs in the house from the last few years. She said she knew she had a Christmas catalog. Excuse me about being a pack rat. Diedrich was astonished to find a picture of an outfit that exactly matched the description of that worn by Melissa. The FBI contacted J.C. Penney, and the store began a search of its records. For more than two months, Tammy Brannan had anxiously waited by the phone for some kind of information or word about her daughter. Where is she? Then, completely unexpectedly, she received a phone call. A man's voice told her he was holding okay? Melissa for ransom and that she must deliver $75,000 the next day yes. or her little girl would be seriously hurt. Can I talk to her? Had Melissa been found? Yes. Yes. The national statistics will tell you that a child who's abducted by a stranger is usually dead within three hours of the abduction. So the likelihood of Melissa being alive months after the abduction, extremely slim. Mom, they have Melissa. Tammy immediately called and her mother, who? but Detective Wilden cautioned them not to let their hopes get too high. No, no, don't, don't call anyone. I'll tell you all about it. Just come over right now. Once again, Melissa Brannon was okay. about to become front page news. Detective Wilden had instructed Tammy Brennan to cooperate with the ransom demands in the hopes her daughter would be recovered alive. As extortion falls under federal guidelines, the FBI coordinated the ransom drop. The FBI SWAT team was ready when two young men showed up in the parking lot to pick up the money. I see him getting ready to open up the door. He got the bag. Go. Here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were quickly arrested. But did they have Melissa in their possession? The information provided in the ransom call was so vague and so generalized, it's entirely possible that the, the, the person who called <clears throat> may have picked up that information simply by watching the news or reading the newspaper. Uh, usually if there's a ransom demand that is legitimate, they're going to have very specific information that would be known only to the abductor and probably some of the investigators. The two arrested youths were former students and roommates from a nearby university who had seen an opportunity to make some easy money out of Tammy Brannan's tragedy. They were convicted of five counts, including conspiracy and extortion, in the United States District Court in Alexandria, Virginia. It turned out to be just a terrible hoax. I mean, just terrible. The, the, the notion that you would do that deliberately uh, to the, uh, a mother who was going through what she was going through. There were copious amounts of dog hairs in the tape samples collected by Fairfax County crime scene investigator Jim Gogan, as well as dozens of human hairs. FBI lab examiners separated and painstakingly subjected each one to testing. Finally, a hair was found that was different from the others. The hair was a very light blonde, the only one of its type found in the vehicle but it was an exact match with the hairs found in Melissa's hairbrush. Matching the human hair with Melissa was the second big match for Diedrich. But the critical link of Melissa's clothes to the fibers from Hughes's car was incomplete without a duplicate big bird outfit to analyze. Because it had been a special Christmas outfit, produced only once, it could not be found in stock. J.C. Penney gave the FBI a list of people who had purchased the outfit from its catalog division. They then sent FBI agents out across the country to locate those people 
and determine if they still had the Big Bird outfit that they had bought from the J.C. Penney catalog, and ultimately they were able to locate a sample outfit from a, a family that still had the outfit. Obtaining the outfit could mean the difference between conviction and acquittal in the case. The FBI asked the family traced through the J.C. Penney records to send it to their crime lab. Well, I remember that day pretty clearly. I, I knew the outfit was coming in. The fiber color, according to the color in the catalog, was navy blue. But the fibers that I was finding were sort of purplish blue. So I was a little anxious that maybe this wasn't the same outfit, that maybe we were going the wrong direction. So when that package came, I was, again, un, un, you know, uncomfortable with even opening it, because I, was, I, w I thought I was on the right track, but I didn't, I didn't want to be wrong. I opened up the box, and sure enough, it had a purplish coloration to it. So it, it kind of gave me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling there that I might have the right color anyway. Fibers were pulled from the red cotton skirt and the blue acrylic sweater. A thorough analysis of the fibers from the outfit indicated an identical match with the fibers from Hughes's car. From the red cotton threads to the blue acrylic yarns to the yellow cross threads from the plaid skirt, the duplicate Big Bird outfit matched in every respect with the car fibers. What I was finding was meaningful evidence that an abduction had taken place that in fact the victim, uh, in all likelihood, had been in the front seat of the subject's car. With the new evidence, the prosecution could now piece together the actions of Caleb Hughes on the night Melissa disappeared. At the party, Hughes had tried to pick up several adult women, but when they rejected him, he sought a substitute. Fueled by frustration and alcohol, Caleb Hughes became a desperate predator with a perverse desire. His stalking eye fell upon the children. He waited and watched until an opportunity presented itself. When it did, Caleb Hughes seized an innocent and trusting child. Hey, Melissa. Remember me? Come here. By abducting Melissa Brennan, Hughes had crossed the boundary into the unspeakable. We had no lights. The analysis of the duplicate Big Bird outfit produced compelling evidence. It would be a powerful tool in the case against a man who investigators felt was a ruthless child molester and murderer. But Agent Diedrich had to convince the jury how incredibly unlikely it would be that these fibers had come from any source other than Melissa's outfit. He began asking people at the FBI to give him any items they may have made of navy blue acrylic. He collected more than a hundred. And the ob objective was to see, do the fibers that I found in the front seat of Cal Hughes' car, do they match any of these? The answer was no. From the items, Diedrich collected 126 different acrylic fibers. He made 7,983 comparison tests with those fibers against the ones found in Hughes's car. Out of almost 8,000 tests, only one succeeded in making an exact microscopic match with the blue acrylic fibers found in Hughes's car. And that was the duplicate Big Bird outfit. Whenever you match two things, it has a lot of significance. These aren't random events. These, in most cases, occur. Is it possible? You can't deny the possibility that it could be a coincidence. But after looking at this stuff for a lot of years, 
I'm not a big believer in coincidence. Three weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, as investigators made final preparations for the case, a stunning development occurred. They received a phone call. Two counties away, police had just found the body of a child on the median strip of Interstate 95. I'll be right there. I called Wilden. We got in his car, and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that, um, that that's, that was going to be it because Hughes uh, knew that area, spent time down in that area. I said, wow, this, this is going to be it. That section of median on I-95 is wide and densely wooded. It would have been easy for Hughes to pull over, hide the body among the thick vegetation, and drive off unnoticed, and there would be little chance of someone finding the remains. But someone found the body. Was it Melissa's? If it was Melissa Brannon's body in the highway median, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan felt he could put Hughes behind bars on murder one charges. His hopes were high, but they were soon dashed. As soon as we got there, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't Melissa Brannon. Because the skeleton had rings on three fingers. Uh, but it was a young girl. She's um, 13, 12, 13, 14 year old, um, who had been in that media for two growing seasons. The young girl's body was never identified. Finally, nearly one year after Melissa's disappearance, Hughes was arrested on a grand jury indictment for abducting Melissa Brannan. He was transferred from the Prince William County Jail to the Fairfax County Jail. Moran had delayed the indictment for several months in the hope that Melissa's body would be found. By then, uh, I know we were all pretty satisfied that the worst had happened to the child. Uh, unfortunately, under Virginia law, uh, you can charge somebody with murder uh, without the body, but you have to be able to prove where the murder occurred. And of course, without the body in this case, um, we had no way of proving where it occurred, so we couldn't charge him with murder. Abduction with intent to defile was the strongest case that could be brought against him. Hughes pleaded not guilty. Few people in Fairfax County believe that Melissa could still be alive. But everyone, most of all Tammy Brannan, needed to know what had happened and needed to see justice served. Because it's tremendously important that the family of that child had definitive answers, that they know what happened to their child, even if the news is not pleasant. They need to understand exactly with concrete information what happened to their child. They need to be able to have closure. They need to be able to, to give that child the burial that they deserve and go on with their lives. With Agent Diedrich's airtight analysis of the trace evidence, Robert Horan went into the trial confident that he could convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt. The trial began on February 26, 1991. A chief part of Horan's strategy was depicting Hughes' deviant sexual behavior at the party. He produced several female witnesses who recalled the crude, vulgar sexual propositions he had made to them, and others who testified he had spent considerable time playing with Melissa and had been talking to her just before she disappeared. His behavior was even more extreme, trying to eliminate the evidence. Washing his clothes, his leather belt, his shoes. He could not account for the fresh cuts on the soles of his shoes nor could he account for his whereabouts for the two and a half hours between leaving the party and arriving home. But the problem for the defense is somehow you had to explain that time, and, and, and there was never an explanation. I mean, it would have gutted our case. Our case is over if you can explain any of that time. 
Though tests for blood on the shoes had proved inconclusive, the prosecution was now able to show the jury the exact matches made between the rabbit hairs, the head hair, and the fibers found in Hughes's car. Nonetheless, the defense argued that all of the fiber and hair evidence was purely circumstantial. It may be circumstantial, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence because it doesn't change. In order to obtain the maximum sentence for Hughes, Moran needed to convince the jury that Hughes had intended to defile Melissa once he had her in his car. And the only way the fibers from her outfit would have been found on the seat is that her, car, her coat had been removed while she was in that car. The prosecution charged that Hughes could only have removed Melissa's coat for one purpose, an attempt to defile. The true answer is that that five-year-old was seated against her will in the front seat of that vehicle. Caleb Hughes's trial lasted eight days. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of abducting Melissa Brannan with intent to defile. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. For the family members, it can't end because of the eternal hope, if you will, that someday this child that's never been seen, never been found, this child someday will, will appear. And that's, that's hard stuff. That is hard stuff. Caleb Hughes is still serving his sentence today, and the body of Melissa Brannan has never been found. Eventually, Tammy Brannan moved from the Woodside apartment complex, but she never changed the telephone number that Melissa had memorized by heart, hoping that one day a call might come.